Hello and welcome to another TLDR US video. In recent weeks, countless scenes of police brutality have circulated on the internet as protests in the US and across the world continue to grow. Despite the anger shown, not many of these officers that you'll see in the clips have had charges levelled against them. This lack of penalty isn't a new issue when it comes to policing in the US, and it's an issue worth taking a look at. So today, we're going to break down why police almost never face prosecution. If you haven't already, and a lot of you haven't, please consider subscribing to the channel for all of the latest updates, from the status of the 2020 election, to the protests, to Trump's battle with the social media giants. Also, tomorrow we're releasing a video about the movement to defund the police. Be sure to subscribe to the channel and hit the bell icon to be notified when that video is released. Thanks so much for your support. There are two key factors here, qualified immunity and police unions. Let's start with qualified immunity. Qualified immunity is a legal doctrine that emerged as a concept in 1967, where the Supreme Court sought a way to prevent public officials, including police officers, from being sued for frivolous or inconsequential actions. This was meant to prevent situations in which petty or extremist members of the population sued officials constantly to prevent them from effectively doing their job. This would also cost the government huge sums of money and was largely decided to be bad for everyone who was involved. And so qualified immunity emerged as a solution. Essentially, the doctrine states that if an official acted in good faith and believed that their actions were justified under the law, they could not be sued or held liable, thus preventing long drawn out court battles that the justices had feared. But over time, qualified immunity was expanded drastically. In the 1982 Supreme Court case, Harlow v Fitzgerald, the court ruled that qualified immunity could only be withheld in cases which showed explicit violation of clearly established statutory or constitutional rights. This cemented the idea that an officer can only be liable if the circumstances and facts of their case are found to be near identical to a previous case. In practice, this made it much harder for judges to not grant qualified immunity, because any small difference in circumstance between the contemporary case and the case being used as precedent can be argued as different enough to not meet the standard of being a clearly established precedent. For example, in April of 2013, Texas police responded to a call asking for help after a man with a gun began firing at people's mailboxes. Upon arriving at the scene, officers took cover behind cars parked in the street and began calling for the man to drop his weapon. A few minutes later, officers saw another man, Gabriel Windsor, a mentally impaired 25-year-old, riding a bicycle down the street with a toy gun on his belt. Within six seconds of being spotted, Windsor was shot 17 times, killing him. A federal court concluded that given Windsor hadn't posed a threat to anyone, the officers had clearly violated his constitutional rights. However, the court went on to say that since no similar situation had arisen in which officers had been held liable, qualified immunity applied. To use the court's words, we cannot conclude that Gabriel's right to be free from excessive force was clearly established here. Similar situations not only occur frequently, but have been increasing in frequency over time. In a recently conducted study, Reuters found that cases of police using excessive force, courts favoured the police 44% of the time between 2005 and 2007. From 2017 to 2019, police were favoured 57% of the time. The study went on to say that in more than three dozen of the analysed cases, officers found to have committed unlawful action were granted qualified immunity. This, unsurprisingly, has garnered a fair bit of criticism in recent years, with both conservatives and liberals calling for an end to this doctrine. The recent protests have only gone to amplify this criticism, and plans currently exist to end qualified immunity altogether. On Thursday, representatives Justin Amash, a libertarian from Michigan, and Anya Presley, a Democrat from Massachusetts, announced that they'd introduced a bill to the House of Representatives to end qualified immunity. The bill, known as the Ending Qualified Immunity Act, specifically states that police officers who violate civil rights 
would not be eligible for immunity and would therefore be fully prosecuted by courts. The Supreme Court may also get involved. The court's slated to discuss multiple cases involving qualified immunity this week, and many have been calling for the court to weigh in on the matter. But even with all of this, prosecuting police brutality in the future would still be no easy feat, and this is in large part because of police unions. Police unions are unlike most other forms of organised labour. They have historically been some of the most powerful labour groups and have exerted a great deal of control over politics, especially local politics, in recent decades. In cities like New York, harsh words from a police union leader are usually enough to corral City Hall into backing off any criticism. This becomes an especially prominent issue when mayors begin contemplating police reform, as New York City Mayor Bill de Blasio has done on multiple occasions. But when mayors float such an idea, they're usually driven back from it quite quickly by police, which is exactly what happened when de Blasio criticised racial bias in policing after Eric Garner's death. So why can police unions exert such force? Part of it is that police unions, unlike other unions across the US, have not seen a significant decline in membership in recent years. This has allowed them to maintain a relatively large amount of sway simply by force of numbers, as other unions have faded into obscurity. This has meant that police unions have a fairly large amount of money, and they're not hesitant to use that money either. For example, the Police Benevolent Association of New York has spent more than $1.4 million in political campaigning and lobbying since 2015, in large part to stop City Hall and state government in Albany from passing laws that would increase transparency in regards to police brutality. And this situation isn't unique in New York either. Police unions across the US exert similar levels of influence on state and local politics, and are usually quite successful in efforts to oppose reform. And it's not just legal reform that these unions are good at quashing. As recent events have brought to light, Police unions also hold a great deal of sway over whether or not their members are prosecuted for abuses of power. And while part of this comes from the aforementioned political power they have, another large part of it comes from their collective bargaining. When it comes to most unions, collective bargaining is used to get things like higher wages and better hours. But while police are certainly concerned with those issues, they don't tend to be the main focus. The main issue that police unions are interested in bargaining for is usually the disciplinary system. Essentially, police generally want a more lenient system for officers, both in terms of punishment and in terms of how they're treated by courts. This often ends up meaning that police aren't given as much punishment for brutality and for abuses of power. University of Victoria economist and Racial Uprising Lab co-founder Rob Gillazoo has been working on a paper regarding the specific results of this system and discussed his preliminary findings with NPR last week. During the interview, Gillazoo said that the big findings he'd come across came through a comparison of US counties with and without unions. Through his comparison, he and his team found that police forces with unions and collective bargaining rights killed significantly more citizens than those without. Overall, this meant that throughout the country, there was an increase of around 60 to 70 deaths per year. However, the catch here is that his comparison wasn't of counties in recent years. It compared counties and number of deaths in the 50s and 60s. This is because fewer police unions existed at the time, and so it was easier for Gillazoo to study the effects of their emergence. This also, however, means that the numbers that Gillazoo found are likely far lower than the modern death tolls as a result of collective bargaining, because, as Gillazoo points out, civilian deaths as a result of police violence were much lower during that time. It's also worth noting that this increase in police violence disproportionately affected minority communities. Essentially, collective bargaining and the strength of unions tends to lead to police feeling safer in their actions, and as Gillazoo's findings point out, this seemingly has a direct effect on the actions of the police, especially in non-white cities and neighbourhoods. When you take qualified immunity and police unions together, it's easy to see why police are so rarely prosecuted. 
the legal and practical system has made it incredibly difficult for police officers to be held accountable for many actions. This system is in large part why protesters today are so angry at police and why police are often hesitant to allow the changes that protesters want to occur. As I mentioned at the beginning of this video, we'll be posting more videos as the situation on the streets progresses, including a video on the movement to defund police departments. So be sure to subscribe and hit the bell icon so that you can be notified whenever we post a new video. Also, let us know your thoughts in the comments below. And as always, you can get involved in the conversation over on Discord.